Tuesday, 2.20 a.m., March 25th, 1913. Even through the fog of sleepiness that enveloped him, May's Dodds could detect the deep concern in Harry Alp's voice coming through the telephone. The safety director asked few questions, listening carefully as the weatherman told him the bad news. The river gauge, which had hit 14 feet at 8 p.m., 15 at 10 p.m., and over 16 at midnight, now showed 18 feet, 8 inches, with no cresting of the river in prospect. There was now, Alps warned, no doubt that the downtown area would get flooded by at least a foot or two of water, and the residential areas might get five or six feet. Dodds thanked him, advised him to continue warning those residents he could reach by telephone, and hung up. In quick succession, he called the local National Guard commander, Fire Chief Ed Ramby, and Police Chief John Alabeck, relaying to them what he had learned and asking each to send patrols into the areas sure to be flooded to begin evacuation. 3 o'clock a.m. Tuesday. As soon as Finette Fox opened her eyes and saw her husband beside the bed with the lantern in his hand and still wearing the dripping raincoat, she knew it had happened again. The water in the Great Miami River had reached that point again, where his observations took concrete action. Still coming up, Andy, she asked sleepily, avoiding meeting his eyes. Something in the tone of her voice, perhaps a shading of disbelief, made him look more closely at her, and he sat on the side of the bed, leaned over, and kissed her gently on the nose. Honey, he said softly, look at me. She raised her eyes to his and saw that the look there was intense, that his brow was furrowed with genuine concern. She started to say something, but he pressed a finger to her lips and shook his head. Listen first, he said. I know I've warned about floods lots of times, and the confession came hard. Mostly I've been wrong. People have laughed at me. I really don't care, but I do care what you think, Finette. This time there's no doubt about it. We're going to have a terrible flood, maybe 20, 30 feet deep. I've got the wagon ready out front. Get dressed and start gathering whatever you have that you can carry and want to save. We've got to get away and somehow convince the others around here what's happening. Finette Fox was moved in spite of herself by the gravity in her husband's voice. She touched his arm and said, you really believe this flood is coming, don't you? I was never more sure of anything, he declared. You remember back in 98 when I said the flood was coming and we did get a pretty bad one. She nodded reluctantly. Every time anyone ever mentioned his false alarms, he always brought up the flooding of 1898, which he had predicted accurately when five feet of water had covered North Dayton and the sewers in their own neighborhood had backed up and there'd been three feet of water in the streets and yards. Well, he continued, it's worse this time, much worse. I stood on the bank and checked the rise of the water. It's about four feet from the top of the levee right now. Three hours ago, it was at least eight below the top and now it seems like it's rising even faster than before. Believe me, Finn, this is it. This is the big one I've known for years was coming. She had to admit to herself. She was impressed. His warning this time was different, more sure of itself, more believable. She slid out of bed and started dressing. For the first time in, in his many years of flood prediction, 
she was beginning to be afraid he was right. 4 o'clock a.m. Tuesday. Police Sergeant Homer Tupman and his partner, Patrolman W.T. Jenkins, began their house-to-house -house evacuation of residents in their assigned area on the near west side along the Wolf Creek Levee at just after 2.30. In an hour and a half, they'd convinced some 200 families that they'd better move out and the streets were lively with people heading toward the slopes to the west. It was at about this time that the streets began filling with water. Within 40 minutes, the water was gushing from the occasional unclosed sewers as if they were fountains. And within an hour, they were wading in at least 20 inches of water. Neither man had ever seen the water coming into the streets so rapidly before. You know, Sarge, Jenkins said, damned if I don't think we're going to have a Winding of a flood this time. Tupman didn't reply, but his face was set in hard lines. He'd just been thinking the very same thing. 4.30 a.m. Tuesday. The presses of the Dayton Journal began rolling at high speed now with the, with the flood extra, but it would be at least 90 minutes before delivery could even begin. Still, it might be some help to those who had not yet heard the warnings. Delivery would be made in the most imperiled areas first, and the paper minced no words. The headline was a single bold black word, warning. This was followed by a variety of stories with subheads that clarified the danger immediately. Flood stage in Miami River rapidly neared, National Guard alerted. River gauge registers 16 feet, 6 inches at midnight, 18 feet, 8 inches at 2.30 a.m. At 23 feet, water will flow over levee. Police and fire de departments have been marshaled. Break in dam eminent in levee south of Steel Dam on Riverdale side. Safety Director Mays Dodds, Fire Chief Ed Ramby, Police Chief John Alabeck patrol all threatened city districts in Dodd's powerful auto. All companies of Ohio National Guard called out to help rescue flooded people. Dayton Union Railroad Company moves string of heavy coal cars onto bridge to save it. Telephone service rapidly going out of service as cable sewers flood. It was a commendable effort, but unfortunately, it came just a little too late. Fewer than one-tenth of the newspapers being printed now would ever be delivered. 4.45 a.m. Tuesday. James W. Porter tapped the blanket, covered form of his son. The boy moaned, and the farmer shook him lightly. Come on, Harold, he said. Milk in time. The 14-year-old turned his head into his pillow and gave another muffled moan, then sat up as the shaking became stronger and squinted his eyes against the glow of the lantern his father was holding. Feel like I just got to sleep, Pa. Ain't it earlier than usual? He asked the question, hopefully, but the gaunt-faced farmer shook his head and smiled. Quarter of five. Same as always. Cows is bellerin already. Reckon you'd sleep till noon if you could get away with it. How you ever gonna manage this farm when I ain't around no more? Shucks, Pa, the boy grinned. I reckon you'll always be around. He lifted the chimney on his own kerosene lamp and lit the wick. It smoked heavily for an instant and then settled down to a bright glow. He replaced the glass and began to dress. The farmer suddenly winced sharply and abruptly walked back to the kitchen, hoping Harold hadn't noticed. So far, no one knew about the trouble he'd been having breathing lately, culminating yesterday with the ragged pain that had bloomed in his chest 
while he was alone in the barn. He had sunk to a sitting position with his back against a stall, and the barbed needles of pain had gradually withdrawn, leaving him weak and frightened. He hadn't told Ida because he knew only too well what her reaction would be. She'd get scared and begin to badger him all over again about going to a doctor for a checkup. James W. Porter did not cotton to doctors, but for the first time he felt himself beginning to waver. Maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea to go, just to satisfy her. There wasn't a thing wrong with him. He knew that. Hell, a man had to expect to get certain miseries as he got older, but, well, maybe he ought to go just to please Ida. He was pulling on his thin denim jacket as Harold clumped into the kitchen, took down his own jacket from the hook by the back door, and put it on. He hesitated for a moment and cocked an ear toward the rain, peppering the roof. Sure getting our share of rain this spring, Pa, he said. Keeps on this way and half the west field will get flooded again. Uh-huh, Porter grunted. He was glad the house and barn were on the highest ground on the, of the farm. Three years ago this month, the Miami River, a quarter mile to the west, had gone over its bank and dumped 18 inches of water into that field. Of course, the rain they'd been having the past couple of days didn't seem quite as hard as that, that one had been, but apparently it was pretty widespread. If they'd had very much to the north, there'd probably be some more flooding. Let's hope not, son, he said. Not after all the work we did last summer, getting them fences strung tight again. The cows were lowing even more loudly now, and Porter ruffled Harold's hair and grinned. Let's get to the milking boy, he said. He opened the door and stepped out onto the porch and then stopped so suddenly that Harold bumped into him. God almighty, he said. What's the matter, Pa? Harold stepped around him and stopped just as shortly as he, too, saw the water. There were two wooden steps up to the porch from yard level, and neither could be seen. A blanket of rapidly flowing muddy water hissed past less than two inches from porch level. It looked as if they were in a big houseboat surrounded by sea. The continued bellowing of the seven cows in the barn took on a new meaning now. Harold found his voice first. Gosh, Pa, it's water. It's a flood. He was frightened and his voice had become squeaky. What are we going to do, Pa? There was only one thing to do. Porter took his son by the shoulder and spoke rapidly but calmly. Hop back into the house and get your ma and sisters up. Tell them, tell them to dress warm. Don't scare them, but tell them to hurry. We've got to get out of here. That water ain't finished coming up yet. Now hop to it. I'll hitch up the wagon. He stepped gingerly into the water, which was three or four inches below his knees in depth, and surged off toward the barn. For an instant, Harold watched him go fighting off a man a mounting panic then he raced into the old house